Emily? Okay. Hi, Danielle. And this Please. is Jill. Yeah. And you can start the broadcast. So we'll, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we'll be getting started in just about a minute. Okay, we're at the top of the hour. I think we can go ahead and get started. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is the this is session two of a two-part series on equitable preparedness for vulnerable populations. And if you attended the previous um, session that we did, you'll know that we um, we've we altered our content a little bit, well, actually quite a bit um, in recognition of what has been happening around the country around COVID-19 and how, and the disproportionate influence impact that it is having on vulnerable populations. And so that in our last um, session, what we really talked about was that disproportionate impact and what is that looking like and how is it manifesting itself out, um, out in the world. Um, and for this session, what we really want to do is pivot and talk about some more specific solutions or strategies to begin to address um, inequitable systems that are impacting vulnerable populations, specifically around disaster preparedness, response, and recovery. So we're really looking forward to a very robust conversation with our panelists and with all of you as participants. Um, Emily, if you want to go to the next slide. We really wanted to first start by just sitting amongst ourselves and acknowledging this moment in time and in history, um, understanding that um, it feels like a lot is, it feel, there's a lot of overwhelming um, pain and suffering um, and anger that, it, that is out in the world right now. Um, and we didn't want to move forward in this conversation without stopping and acknowledging um, that reality, um, but also really um, bringing us back to the roots of the Community Health Center movement, um, and specifically Dr. Jack Geiger, who was the founder of the first Community Health Center, um, who really believed that a Community Health Center serves as an agent of social change, and that community health centers intervene not only in the social determinants of a population's health, but also launching a process of structural change that starts to liberate that population through community empowerment from repetitive cycles of poverty and political exclusion. And we really feel like this is, it has never been more relevant. It has always been relevant, but what we have seen happening around the country um, makes it uh, all the more relevant for our conversation today and our, our conversation going forward. And we really need, really want to keep that kind of front and center in our in our thoughts and in our um, actions moving forward. So on just a practical level, um, this if you have any technical difficulties or if there are people that you feel like could benefit from this webinar but are not able to attend today, it is being recorded and it will be available for you to share. Um, Danielle is our fearless leader, and you'll see her in the in the chat box. So if you have any technical challenges with WebEx, just um, ping Danielle, and she will help you out. So just a little bit about the and again, some of you have attended other social determinant of health social determinant of health academy sessions, but just to let you know, this is a we're a group of National Cooperative Agreements funded by HRSA to provide training and technical assistance to community health centers nationwide. Um, and we, um, we came together as a group of organizations um, 
dedicated to training and technical assistance and wanted to specifically focus on social determinants of health among some of the other things that we're addressing. But we really felt that collectively we, we could make um, a greater impact um, and that we had quite a bit of really fantastic information to share as a, as a group. So the Academy um, is uh, our target audience, our staff from health centers, but we also primary care associations, health center controlled networks, and then other people who participate in um, or are active in, in public health or, or serving the underserved. Each of our, each of these learning collaborators, and this is now the last in the 2020 series, um, we had eight total. So this is the very last, but we'll, today's session will be um, a, an hour of didactic followed by 30 minutes of office hours. So we are looking forward to that. Um, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions um, through via the chat box. Um, we encourage you to be very active in that chat box throughout. Um, okay, and then, so this is the Social Determinants of Health Academy faculty, the organizations that are represented, just so you can see all of us. We are a diverse group, really fantastic colleagues. Um, and then these were the four series, each of these series, each each one of these consisted of two. So um, the first one really looked at data in patient care and social determinants of health. The second looked at healthcare workforce issues. The second looked at reducing health disparities through community partnerships. And then this fourth one is on equitable preparedness. And just to let you know that the the Social Determinant of Health Academy really built itself on a series of core competencies, which we identified collectively. And the four competencies that we identified and addressed through the series was improving access to quality healthcare and services, uh, fostering a healthcare workforce, enhancing population health and addressing health disparities through community partnerships, and then understanding emerging issues. And clearly, each one of these is a very broad um, topic area. So we, the competencies are not going to be, you know, every single issue in the competencies is not addressed in one series. But what we did was then chose within those core competencies, we um, took a deeper dive into some key, key issues. So for instance, in the understanding emerging issues, um, we are addressing uh, emergency preparedness response and recovery for right now. And um, today's session is, it's a collaboration between the National Nurse-Led Care Consortium. My colleague Emily Kane is on and will be speaking in a second. And then I'm from the Migrant Clinicians Network. My name is Jillian Hopewell. By the way, I don't believe I, I said that previously, but Emily and I collaborated on this series um, and we're very fortunate to bring in a group of, for both, for each of the sessions that we worked on brought together some incredible faculty for those. Okay, so speaking of our faculty, um, we have Alex Lipo, <laughs> Alex, I knew I was gonna mess it up, Alex Lipo, Liposet, but he said I could call him Alex L. Um, but Alex is with the uh, New York Primary Care Association. And then Tina Wright is with the Mass Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. And together, Alex and Tina are co-chairs of the PCA Emergency Management Advisory Coalition. Maricel Pagan Santana is, uh, she works with the Migrant Clinicians Network. She's a colleague of mine. Um, and she works um, in Puerto Rico on MCN's climate related projects and manages our community mobilization uh, for emergency uh, programs. And they'll all introduce themselves a little bit more in depth, but that's just a brief overview of, of our panelists. And it should be a really robust conversation with all, all three of these folks. So finally, today's webinar is actually the, the two webinars together. So in the previous one, we talked about understanding the ways in which emergencies disproportionately affect vulnerable populations. Um, in today's webinar, we're really take, tackling the second two, identifying strategies to adequately and equitably prepare for disasters and emergencies in a health center setting and in the community, really. Um, it's not in there, but that's a key piece that we're working on. 
and then discussing interventions to assist patients, families, and communities during emergencies. Okay, I believe I get over to you now, Emily. Right? Oh no, just yeah. see that there's a <laughs> session evaluation at the end. We really appreciate it um, if you're able to participate in that. Um, it gives us a ton of information, and we really pay attention. Great, thank you, Jillian. Yeah, I've, I've had a sinking uh, suspicion there was one more slide, but uh, we actually wanted to take some time, you know, for those of you who joined us on our last session, we assigned some optional homework for all of you to kind of, you know, um, fill out a pandemic assessment, and, you know, to see uh, what things you have learned about uh, your, your own organization's preparedness and some of the social determinants of health implications um, that have resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. And 10 of you filled out that assessment, which was really great. Um, it was wonderful to see some of those um, responses and kind of learn more about what all of you are experiencing. Uh, and so this is just the first result of the first question we asked on that assessment. And it seems like um, the majority of folks who responded felt that they were moderately prepared to address SDOH during COVID-19. And so we actually wanted to open up today and really just ask everyone, um, those who were on last time and who weren't, uh, and even those who answered the assessment, maybe just um, reflect and, and either answer again with the same answer or, or maybe you have a different one today. But we wanted to poll everyone and ask, to what extent was your organization prepared to address SDOH during the COVID-19 pandemic? So that's a poll that should be popping up for all of you. Uh, we're gonna give everyone a few seconds to complete that poll. And then Danielle, if you could share the results once everyone has, um, uh, once everyone has completed that, that would be great. Sure, no problem. All right, so hopefully folks are filling that out. Um, really interested to see if, if our poll results today align with what we saw in the, uh, in the assessment. We have about 55% of the people who have answered so far. Okay, great. You can go ahead and share those, I think. Um, for some reason, I'm not seeing the results on my screen. Danielle, could you t let us know what they were? I can, I can show uh, you. Yeah. So, oh, sorry, Jillian. Could, can you see it on your screen? So I there can is see it on my screen. Yeah. Um, let me share just because your sound is still a little bit warbly. Sure. Uh, One percent said they're extremely prepared. Eleven percent said very prepared. 38% uh, said moderately prepared, 41 said somewhat, and 9% said not at all. Okay, so yeah, that's that's really interesting. And similar responses, but maybe um, some additional folks who maybe thought uh, somewhat as opposed to moderately prepared. So that's a really interesting kind of reflection for us to have. And you know, one of the things we wanted to ask was, what would have helped you feel more prepared? You know, for those of you who said, you know, somewhat or moderately, um, or even not at all, you know, what would have helped you feel more prepared? And feel free if you have, um, we have these options on the poll, but if you have other um, items you want to bring up that would have helped you feel more prepared, we'd love for you to share those in the chat and we'll be, um, Danielle will be sharing those. So once again, Jillian, if you could read those results when Danielle shares them, that would be great. And just, you, I'm sure you all can see there, but just to let you know that um, the other, if you want to type in the chat, if you have something else that would have occurred to you, we're actually limited to five answers here. So we know there's more. All right, so love to see those shared if folks have had time to answer that poll. All right. Oh. Okay. So what folks are saying is uh, 
29% would have benefited from increased awareness of community resources, 17% from regular check-ins about emergency preparedness with staff, 24% um, patient data about working conditions and financial mm -hmm. security, 25% contingency plans for staff, uh, which includes furloughs and redeployment, and then 5% other. Okay, and great. Feel free to type your other into the chat, but it's really, this is an interesting, interesting one, um, Emily. We did limit it to a, a single answer, which I'm sure was challenging for all of you. Yes. But it's <laughs> fairly evenly. It's, you know, except for 29 for community resources and 17 for regular check-ins. It's almost, you know, a quarter for each one of these. Yes. Yeah, it is really interesting. And I'm sure all of you, you know, many of you, I should say, would have picked all of those. And so I guess it's really a matter of what would have been most helpful. And it sounds like these are these each of these four elements, you know, really might be things to build into um, existing emergency preparedness efforts. Or if you feel like they're not included um, in regular staff meetings or in um, a systematic way at, the, at your health center, a really interesting consideration to think about how to incorporate these uh, into future plans, uh, knowing that, you know, we will certainly face things maybe not exactly like COVID-19, but, um, but you know, very difficult things in the future as well. Now, I'd love our, for our panelists to maybe speak to these um, when they get to their slides. And so, Emily, just to, just so we don't lose it here, um, yep. there's a couple really interesting responses um, that have come in um, on the chat as far as other. One is regular check-ins about emergency preparedness with staff and prepared with PPE, so PPE issues. Uh, funding is another one. Community partnerships, um, which actually that's that will be addressed um, by our panelists, so I, that hopefully you'll get some good information there. Um, and there's one here about warning clients about service changes prior to making the changes so we could work together to better assist them before those changes occur. Excellent. Oh, one more. And other increased awareness of community resources. So again, yeah, we're gonna be addressing that um, in these sessions. Great, thank you all for sharing those. And you can continue to share those in the chat. I think this is really helpful. Um, for all of us to kind of take a look at. We also asked uh, a few other questions, um, one of which was, which of the following factors have been worsened or exacerbated for your patients and families? And we saw, you know, working conditions and economic stability were um, a huge number, uh, percentage of those answers. And so that's something that we definitely want to consider and think about um, as we hear from our panelists today and as we go into office hours, um, really trying to get some resources and promising practices around both of those issues. Uh, speaking of promising practices, many of you shared some of those with us in the assessment, um, including having weekly community outreach meetings to keep a pulse on the needs of our patients in the community, as well as the available services for our patients, um, daily resource updates. Uh, it wasn't specific about what that was, but it could be emails or maybe um, a you know, huddle with staff, providing masks and telehealth appointments, and giving out phones to patients. So these are all some great promising practices that you all shared with us. And then finally, you all shared some concerns, um, some major issues and concerns that you have going forward. Uh, and we kind of put these together in a, in a sort of word bubble for, for us to think about, again, that economic stability, um, you know, and jobs, those, those issues around financial um, stability and literacy come up again and again. So really wanting to make sure that we have a focus on that um, as we continue our discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex Lipachev, who's going to kick us off with some of um, what's ha been happening in New York City. Alex? Thank you, Emily. Hi, everyone. This is Alex Lipachev, or Alex L. Um, I work for New York PCA, Community Healthcare Association of New York State, GTNIS for short. And I am um, the Director of Emergency Preparedness for the PCA. I've been in the role for over five years now. I'm also a social worker by trade, by my um, uh, education, and I'm licensed to practice uh, clinical social work here in New York. Um, so the topic was near and dear for me, so I said absolutely yes when I got an invitation. But uh, when I started preparing for my piece, it became very clear that it's just not going to be a very easy topic to present. I don't want to 
necessarily uh, give you the answers, but I wanted to frame the conversation and start off with giving you food for thought. I know that my other colleagues will address um, some of the answers, but with the food for thought, let's start with the definition of social determinants of health that Centers for Disease Control give us. And um, what CDC says is conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. These conditions are known as social determinants of health. So when we're looking at conditions, I thought that um, numbers and data would probably paint a better picture than I could ever do. And I think we will start with the first graph um, that will show you um, some information on New York City COVID cases. So we're looking at the domain for um, race and ethnicity, and this is the data from New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and in three domains, uh, race and ethnicity, as you can see for 100,000 people uh, in cases, Hispanic, Latino, Black, African-American are on the higher uh, bars. When we go to hospitalizations, which is the next graph, again, you will see that Hispanic, Latino, Black, African-American is in the highest. When we go to deaths, again, the same trend. When we, move, when we move to the second domain, which is the poverty level, unfortunately, we will see a similar picture. Very high poverty levels are the highest number of cases of COVID. Hospitalizations the same, and death rates are the same. The, po the poorer you are, the worse you're off for COVID. Now, geographically, and those folks who know the geography of New York, uh, this will probably be very reminiscent of what you know about the neighborhoods in New York City. And if we're looking at the geography of New York broken down by zip codes, the percent of positive tests, really the darker um, color on the map, the higher percentage of positive tests, it almost one-to-one -one corresponds with poorer neighborhoods. You can see the darker Bronx, the northwestern Staten Island, the eastern Brooklyn part. LaGuardia is maybe a bit of an outlier here, but Rockaway, um, where Sandy hit and the access to healthcare has always been a challenge. So you can see even geographically the presentation is pretty uh, telling. The next domain that I wanted to point out is um, the prism of the rates. Again, similar trend geographically paints a picture. Wealthier neighborhoods are better off in COVID pandemic in New York City. And the next map will repeat also the same trend. Uh, geographically, the death rate, again, is higher in poorer neighborhoods and the minorities. Um, so this is New York City data. Um, I actually am giving you the link. If you click on that link on the source, you can look at other sources of data, but um, it's pretty um, telling. When we go to New York State data, it's not as graphically pretty, but it's, again, it's available. And I want to point out the lower uh, quadrants on the very bottom on the right, the rate per 100,000 population Again, Blacks and Hispanics are in the higher rates, and the age also in the higher rates. So what does it tell us? At least to me, it tells um, that, well, when the COVID hits something like New York, again, the poorer, uh, the minorities are uh, affected much, much higher. So I think it was pretty clear for us as the primary care association. And again, we are still in the epicenter of the pandemic. New York was hit first and hardest. It's, we're still the headquarters of COVID, I believe, um, even though we're coming out of it. But what we were trying to figure out is there was a huge need for information. So I think I want to continue our discussion or sort of presentation through the prism of data. 
New York Primary Care Association, Chikinis, started collecting data. We activated in March, and pretty shortly after that, we started filling out or requesting our health centers to fill out uh, weekly surveys, which were then um, um, organized in sort of one pagers that telling the story. Again, those are available, but I wanted to highlight a couple of trends that we identified. So the first graph that you see was our uh, one of the first surveys in March, and we were interested, and it was very clear through our um, anecdotal evidence and now data evidence that the health center visit volume started falling. Now remember, right, so the access to healthcare is very important. Again, the FQHCs, health centers are located in those areas with most need, and yet there was this huge trend on um, the visit volume going down, and what does that mean? It means that folks in health centers needed money to continue operations, and the money was also going down with the visit volume. So um, health centers started to look at that, and um, you will hear about this, but um, this graph represents the volume of telehealth visits. Again, what was planned for a few years in advance with a very nice um, plan of rolling it out slowly had to happen in a matter of weeks. So in January, uh, the beginning of the graph, you saw 104 visits that were conducted via telehealth. At the beginning of April, you see a huge jump to 19 plus thousand uh, visits that were conducted via telehealth. So health centers stepped up and started producing uh, and providing access to care via telehealth because it was um, a necessity and that was the only way to um, provide um, some kind of services in the, in, in the view of falling in-person patient visits. The next graph, if we go to the next um, piece of um, trends, we're moving towards April and as you see, Again, the telehealth visits um, started dividing into audio only and those with audio video, which are telemedicine um, and in person. So things started to stabilize a little bit in regards to access to healthcare. Uh, there was huge issues with reimbursement. New York State decided not to um, reimburse FQHCs for telehealth visits but our health centers still continue to provide the telehealth visits in, even in light of the lack of reimbursement that was uh, since uh, resolved, but the issues continue. And the last uh, graph for this slide that I wanted to show you is that even though things stabilized a little bit and you see that uh, in-person telehealth audiovisual or audio only is there and there's two kinds uh, of telehealth visits that are available. The patient volume, the visit volume is still nowhere near what it was at the beginning of the pandemic, which we consider uh, March. But then if you go back to the data graph in January, you see the difference. So again, what does that mean? Is that health centers are struggling, access is there, but on what level? And financially, it's all leading to the lack of healthcare access to the vulnerable populations. Okay, so um, this is our most recent survey. And I think I wanted to give you some of this to frame the conversation further. So this is our survey as of two days ago. Um, telehealth has become the new normal. 100% of respondents, and we have a rate for this specific survey of 65% of our FQHCs. We're a pretty large state with uh, more than 70 networks, community health center networks with 800 plus individual locations across the state. So 65 of those responded and 100% of them have some kind of offering for telehealth, either by phone only or with video uh, audio. Um, and 89% occurred remotely, which again, for the next graph, you can see the comparison of how telehealth is becoming the new normal. Uh, but here's the issue, telehealth, although it came to the rescue, so to say, there's still some questions to be answered and it's not the panacea to all 
problems, right? So yes, it's great that we have access to telehealth, but what about those vulnerable? Do they have access to a device? Do they have access to the phone? Do they have a plan, the data plan to be able to pick up? And what do you do if your health, um, if your patients are a, don't have access to that? Um, there's been some conversation and there's uh, been some uh, offers to us, New York PCA, from community groups to provide devices to the patients who need the most. And again, I don't want to take too much time, but it's a good question to ask of how you actually do provide access to telehealth, even though it's easier, but it's still challenging. And speaking of challenging, uh, the next uh, slide will show you that there is a huge issue with staffing and our FQHCs struggled with staff. Um, and so while 100% of our networks had at least one site open, we didn't have any networks that were shut down. But within all of those networks that are available, there is a percentage of closures and the sites that are not available. As you see, this is again, the most recent data. So pretty much all the school-based health centers are closed. The dentist um, only sites were closed. We're only now starting to reopen as of June 1st was the official reopening date for dental practices uh, for the work. Um, and again, 76% of respondents are saying that they were, they were affected by staff issues, furloughed, laid off, working in reduced hours. You'd be interested to see, I think, that the next graph shows that the trend for the staffing, instead of going up, uh, sorry, instead of going down, it's kind of going up in regards to staff that are either furlo furloughed, um, or laid off, and or working in reduced hours. You'd think that with going up and reopening, you would see a trend of down, but it's surprising that there's still rather large issues with um, staff at the health centers providing care. So all of this, again, is about access to healthcare and providing the services that are absolutely needed based on the initial slides for the data of those affected, right? So those most vulnerable are affected most, and the FQHCs who are serving most vulnerable are struggling. Now, I want to point out um, the next slide that talks about this article. And I think if I'm not doing a good job explaining and raising questions in your minds on what it is that we need to think about, talk about, and pay attention to, please do read this article that came out in the New York Times Magazine. This article is um, written by a journalist, but it's presented through the eyes of the chief nursing officer of one of our health centers, Callan Lord Community Health Center. So um, Anthony Fordenberry, who you see in the picture, is uh, the chief nursing officer of the health center, and he is walking the journalist through the struggles of a day-to-day -day COVID response um, situation in which heroically, it's, you know, the work is being described of what the FQHCs are doing for vulnerable population, but what it is that folks absolutely need to think about. There's voices not of just our New York FQHC, there's a voice of the National Association of Community Health Centers and other FQHCs in the article. So please do read it. I think it would really um, be a fantastic read for you on the topic that we're talking about. But I wanted to point out a couple of statements made in the article. And the first one of them on our next frame is, so for many community health centers, dealing with the immediate impact of COVID-19 is drawing down the resources at the very moment they need to be making preparations for a more extended public health crisis, right? So while there is this huge impact on operations, right? Think about telehealth and what that means. Some of the things that came up in the polls, uh, letting your folks know communications, internal, external, who, what's happening, what's needed, um, looking for resources. All of this is happening and it's drawing down the resources of, of you, FQHCs, on what you need to do now. 
But then, okay, we're in the reopening stage and you need to be ready and getting ready to reopen and welcome all of these people who have hadn't who haven't had the care for so many months. And that's where PPE comes in place, right? What you do with the dentist practice where there is no access to PPE. All of this is really challenging the health centers. The second point was it's even more critical that we stay on top of their care now. And by there, the uh, quote means the vulnerable populations. Well, yes, it's absolutely more critical that we stay on top of their care now because again, remember the first data graphs. Those are the folks who were affected by COVID most. Those are the folks who lost their job. And remember the definition of social determinants of health, it's the conditions. So the conditions are being affected. And um, so it's more critical that we address those people in those conditions that would determine the health outcomes. And yet it's really, really tough. And um, last piece here that I wanted to point out is the morale and mental health piece, right? So morale has been harder to maintain the longer we have to keep this up. As a social worker, again, I think it's pretty clear that the um, fallout of this pandemic will be felt through years and years, and we are going to deal with mental health issues related directly or indirectly with this for quite a while. So. Uh, what I wanted to bring up, not as an answer again, but something to think about is trauma-informed care, TIC. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's, there's a lot of information about TIC and lots of people and entities that are dealing with trauma-informed care. So in New York, we have partnered with the... Um, State University of New York in Buffalo um, Institute of Trauma-Informed Care. Um, and what we're doing is we are going to uh, do a pilot project with 10 FQHCs, 10 networks to um, as a learning collaborative to build the trauma-informed care approaches to how they uh, operate. And we're not looking at trauma-informed care um, in clinical work, because you can look through the treatment of clinicians doing trauma-informed care approaches and about treatment of uh, uh, patients. We're talking about organizational approaches in trauma-informed care. And again, everybody was affected by this, both your staff and the patients you treat. Um, so the way we think it's important to remember and address things is to come through the trauma-informed care approach uh, on providing what's needed, but also not to uh, re-traumatize folks. So with that, I am going to um, transfer the baton to my colleague, Tina, who will actually dive a little bit further into some of the issues that I'm bringing up as food for thought. And Tina, Alex, the floor is uh, yours. Uh, uh, one second, Alex. There were a few questions that came in on oh, the sure. chat, and um, maybe we can address those now. Sure. Um, Tina starts up, because um, some of them there were pretty specific to yours. So let me yep. see if I can read this one through, because there's some <laughs> there's some shortened stuff here. But among those with, with the telehealth behavioral health visits, what percent were open cases that previously were attending face-to-face -face visits? And has any satisfaction data been collected to determine, to determine if behavioral health patients uh, are prefer, or physical health for that matter, are preferring telemedicine? You know, that's a very, very good question and a very concrete question. And if I cannot answer this question right this minute, but I will be absolutely uh, sure to find the answers for you. And we'll get back to you on that one because it is very specific. I don't have that answer. Yeah, and there's another question about outcome measure data determine the efficacy of behavioral health. Um, which may, I think, is may fall into that same category. Yeah, I would defer to the concrete answers that I will find out and go back okay. to you. I cannot then, give you the concrete answers. And then Jack Becker in Denver, Colorado, um, had a question about the role of community health workers. And if you don't mind, um, some of that is going to be addressed um, during Maricel's presentation, the third one here. So if you're all right with that, Alex, unless you want to address I'm totally that. all right with that. Yes, absolutely. And yes, community health workers were involved. Uh, but New York City, uh, where the pandemic has stricken most, there are some 
you know, local issues with how things are set up and what we do here. So uh, let's listen to Maricel's part and then we can um, discuss as a group. Great, thank you, so Alex. So my name is Tina Wright. I am the Director of Emergency Management at the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, the primary care association for the state of Massachusetts. I actually started at the Mass League in 2001 prior to 9-11 and since then have deviated my career to be right alongside our community health centers in the state uh, to learn emergency management and what our role is in outpatient care and in community health care. And just to reflect on what's been happening across our country in the last week, I'm very grateful that I work in this environment and am part of an organizational movement uh, seeking social and racial justice and change. So thank you for this opportunity pr to present today. Uh, next slide. I'm going to highlight today some data-driven uh, work that's been happening in Massachusetts, not only for advocating for health centers and for telehealth, but also so that we can really make some strategies and concrete movements to help specifically address what our patients are experiencing uh, in our state and connecting them to resources. Um, one of the things that we have definitely seen is telehealth is extremely important, and I'm gonna touch a little bit on that towards the end of my slides, and behavioral health access is key to that uh, as well. Uh, we've been able to use a lot of the data that I'm gonna highlight to work with our legislators to advocate for coverage. We are a Medicaid expansion state, so that makes us a little bit unique in our ability to do that advocacy and reimbursement rate uh, review with our legislature, but uh, I'm gonna highlight some of that for you and how this data helps uh, with that as well. And then we have an outreach campaign that is just uh, launching today, specifically about the fact that health centers are open, we have new rules, new tools, but it's the same great care, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that campaign. Next slide. So in Massachusetts, uh, a task force was created very early on into our concerns about COVID entering into the United States and what we started to see across the country uh, back in March of 2020. We really anticipated as stakeholders across the healthcare spectrum that communities that are already facing marginalization would be hardest hit by COVID and especially by the economic repercussions, starkly exposing inequities, driven by racism, poverty, and xenophobia. So this group came together of which our deputy CEO, Michael Curry of the Mass League is uh, one of the co-chairs on the um, Strategic Advisory Committee, uh, which is also chaired by one of our health center CEOs who is also a former state public health uh, commissioner. They came together and specifically told the state that they needed to improve collection and reporting of demographic data on testing, confirm cases, and deaths. They also stressed the release of municipal level uh, numbers around the testing confirmed te cases and deaths so that hotspots could be identified while upholding privacy rights as well. They wanted the state to monitor racial inequities, uh, monitor inequities in the application and the impact of clinical crisis standards of care in particular regarding race, disability status, homelessness and incarceration. And they will ask the state to regularly report on these actions. So we did this really early on and got a lot of stakeholders involved. Next slide. Our state is really proud of the fact that they're putting out daily numbers. And uh, although they were not collecting a lot of data at first on race and ethnicity, they are now, and they're putting up a dashboard daily uh, that highlights some of this information. But as you can see on the slide, although mine are not as pretty as Alex's mapping ones, um, that light blue color is highlighting unknown or missing information. Uh, that's a significant gap. And when we started seeing that at the Mass League, we tried to think of what can we do because we have access to demographic data um, that the state might not be collecting. So how can we as a primary care association work with our health centers, demographic data and electronic systems to help health centers move into the forefront of testing and contact tracing areas while targeting those hot spots and specifically are be proactive in addressing our own patient needs. Next slide. So what we've been able to do uh, is 
working with publicly available data as well as uh, the uniform data system mapper uds mapper for those um, who are familiar with it to really look at the penetration rates of the health centers and so with the state data and this map that you're looking at right here is a little little old uh, excuse me this sheet is a little bit older it uh, comes through may 27th and we're doing this on a weekly basis uh, so these numbers are not current but for demonstration purposes i did want to share them we were able to pull the publicly forward-facing data and pull in information from UDS Mapper and really overlay those zip codes and look at percent positivity rates, which is in the red, and then look at the penetration rate of low-income populations per the community health center of that zip code. And it was really astonishing the more we kept looking at this data, seeing confirmed again and again that it, are, it is our low income and minority uh, populations that are having really high positivity rates. Um, where you see the highest positive cases, our health centers are there. They're providing care to our most vulnerable and they're supporting the opening of testing sites in these communities. It's a crucial impact that we're trying to be a part of. We've also become involved uh, in very, uh, complicated ways in local contact tracing and uh, with partners in health uh, who the state has contracted with to help support the contact tracing collaborative in Massachusetts. And I do want to give credit to the team at the Mass League. I am not the analytics expert. It is really uh, our workforce and uh, policy team that is doing this. So Mary Ellen McIntyre, as well as Zabine Munshi from our uh, Workforce Data and Business Systems Division. They have been crunching these numbers weekly. Uh, next slide. So again, this slide is looking at the top 10 cities and towns. Uh, it demonstrates where there's been increase of testing. So of course, the increase in results uh, also comes back. Uh, it is in these communities, Brockton, Lynn, Chelsea, Lowell, uh, they've all stepped up uh, uh, their testing abilities in their communities uh, based on some of the data that we're seeing come out for those hot spots. Next slide. So in Boston in particular, there are various neighborhoods. Uh, we have 22 health centers, more than uh, 30 sites across the city, not including our school-based and our uh, homeless uh, population uh, in the shelters, uh, working with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. But these hotspots were also just really, really astonishing to us the more and more we saw the data. And so what we were able to do is work, work very early on with the Boston Public Health Commission uh, to sign up health centers in these neighborhoods that were showing high positivity rates to get open testing sites at the health centers. Knowing that the health centers are the trusted source of care in those neighborhoods and that they're also locally available as transportation is also an issue in Massachusetts, especially in dense neighborhoods like the city of Boston. Uh, we were able to pull this information and overlap it with other circumstances as well, with other SDOH categories, such as transportation, such as poverty. Uh, and although it doesn't show it on the slide, this grid actually continues to go for many, many columns. So we're able to overlay this information and hand it back to the health centers to help them figure out where those hotspots are and where they want to put the assets in the community. We are also, our community health centers across the city of Boston are named in the city's infectious disease response plan as the first line of defense in a infectious disease outbreak. And even 10 years ago during H1N1, we were leading the efforts for vaccination rates in the country. And so we're really watching not only the lessons learned from 10 years ago from H1N1, but how they can also be applied to improve our response across Massachusetts with the health centers leading in this space and one of the things I'll even point out with this data, and again, this is a little bit older data, and it's all public forwardly facing. The sources are on the left there. Please feel free to check them out if you if you like data. Uh, but the neighborhood of East Boston now has the highest rate of positive tests at 39%, with over 3,000 residents or 6.5% of the population tested. And note that this grid, like I said, on the grid due to space, we know that 58% of East Boston neighborhood population use public transportation. So knowing that is really in, important in where we're putting the resources. East Boston and its neighboring health centers provide care to well over 100% of the low income population. In Mattapan, it's the second highest 
has a rate of positive tests at 37% with almost 1,700 residents. That's 5.7% of the population tested. And again, not included in the grid is the, the public use of transportation. 32% uh, of the Mattapan neighborhood uses public transportation. And now Mattapan and Cloudman Square and its neighboring health centers are providing 95% of care uh, to that low income population. These data points are helping us tell the stories in our advocacy efforts as well. So it comes very important data points. Next slide. So we have looking at this in a couple of different ways. I hope you're finding this helpful and think about how you can use your own data in, at your own health center to help you with hotspot identifying and connecting resources to those areas. And again, this is very Boston specific, but uh, it's the, pop, the blue is the population tested, the red is the uh, of tested, what percent was positive, and the health center's penetration rate of the low income population. And this was being put out there at a per 100,000 uh, rate, and they have since switched to percentages. Uh, the neighborhoods are sorted by the percent of positive cases, um, overlaid with the health center's penetration rate of low income population and the percent of the neighborhood population tested. Next slide. <laughs> our qualitative reports, we are meeting with our health centers weekly at this point, and we're hearing uh, both anecdotally and in the data some of the things that we are we already knew were coming and, and showing that the communities of color are so disproportionately impacted by COVID. And it was these qualitative reports that really uh, stood out and helped us expand access to testing, even though we are experiencing a national shortage of supplies and uh, for the testing. We've also found that there are uh, areas where testing remains low and it's not because of supply or testing shortages, it's actually because of fear of the people in the neighborhoods to have a test that says they can't return to work. We are having our, our providers telling us their patients are coming in, they are so afraid that they are going to be um, either laid off or quarantined for two weeks and they will miss that income uh, providing time, income uh, work time and are afraid of losing their jobs. Next slide. So our own data from our own um, UDS system and pulling this from the HRSA data that comes out weekly. There's a survey that every federally qualified health center in the country should be invited to complete on a weekly basis. Uh, it goes out on Friday. You have until Tuesday, I think afternoon or midnight to get that data in. But even when we were looking at some of this data and comparing it to previous weeks and comparing it to some of the data we have through our health center's electronic systems, there are still some gaps and we wanna be clear when we're looking at this data. We wanna not only try to have a clear picture of what is happening operationally on the ground level, but we also wanna continually test the data to make sure that it's accurate, Ac not only accurate, but it doesn't misrepresent the actual numbers and the impacts on our communities. Our policy team is on regular calls with the state, especially on reimbursement rates. And this is so important as well. Next slide. So our data-driven decisions around addressing social uh, determinants of health, structural determinants of health, our calculation is using the state-released zip code and municipality level data on testing and the positive rates overlaid with our UDS mapper and getting that health center penetration rate, public health center testing sites, and that comes from the testing survey questions from HRSA. We as a primary care association do get that information shared back from HRSA, which is great. It has absolutely helped us. Um, and then US census data by neighborhood is also uh, overlaid. Although the HRSA data is not shareable at an individual level, um, we are able to use it in the aggregate to help drive our storytelling and advocacy beyond uh, the data points. And, and again, it goes to that sto uh, storytelling that is so important in our advocacy, especially around advocating for uh, our reimbursement rates uh, with telehealth, with Medicaid, with the Division of Insurance and the insurance uh, regulators at the state. So again, telehealth, if any bright spot can come out of COVID-19, it's the rapid advancement and acceptance of telehealth. 
we were looking at two to three years in Massachusetts uh, to roll out telehealth and to really work with our legislature and rate reimbursements and insurers. And we got it up and running in about two to three weeks. It really is, is miraculous what our health centers, what you health centers can do to be able to adjust to be there for your patients. The telehealth and telephonic rate adv advocacy for reimbursement in our state has been unreal. Our policy team is just amazing. Uh, we, they immediately got engaged around the financial crisis when the stay at home orders came out. They worked with the division of insurance and really pushed for those reimbursement rates for our members in Massachusetts. But again, we're a Medicaid expansion state. So it, it's a little bit easier for us to have those connections and, and to work with our teams um, and our members of Congress and the legislature on that. We also have heard of our success in Massachusetts with behavioral health. One of the things it, it's not missing, but I would say it was bypassed. We're getting reports from uh, our providers that patients that would never seek out a behavioral health encounter because of in, uh, implicit bias around it are now reaching out and able to participate in a telephone, telephonic or telehealth uh, encounter. Their no-show rates have had a notable decline and that has been very promising. And we, we're hoping to look at that from a qualitative um, to the question that was asked earlier as the data continues to parse out and we have some more time to, to really review it. We're hoping to have some qualitative measures on that. Uh, there are still challenges, of course, with telehealth, and we're hearing that is uh, having a safe private space to conduct an encounter, whether in the home or in a in a um, housing community, uh, not having a private location where you can go. I've also even heard this specifically from our migrant farm worker program as well. Uh, having a, a cell phone, but not necessarily a smartphone that has video technology, uh, not only not having one, but knowing how to use one. Uh, the lack of technology use know-how is also seen in some of our age uh, demographics as well. The shortage of data minutes for telehealth, telehealth use has also come up. Uh, so finding access to free Wi-Fi in order to be able to have that telehealth encounter. And then fear uh, and lack of knowledge of the technology. There are definitely some of our patients out there who just are not trusting uh, what is going out over the internet, of course. So that's also part of the educational piece. And our average percent of health center visits conducted virtually um, have grown to 73%. So one of the things that we have used this data to help us uh, create is a public service um, announcement campaign. Uh, it's airing today, I believe, on our ABC affiliate here in Massachusetts. And we're also doing very targeted uh, translated ads on Facebook by zip code. And we have tested our messages for literacy and cultural competence. We wanna make sure the message is out there. We didn't close, we adapted to the needs of our patients. So new rules, new tools, same great care. Don't put your health on hold. And with that, I want to thank you for the time, and I think I am passing it on to our next speaker, Marisol. Thank you, Tina. Um, I'm going to try to get as um, quick as possible so we can get to each of the slides and we can have time for the office hours. So as Dillian said, I, I, I'm, part, I'm Maricel Pagam. I'm part from, of Migrant Clinic Networks. I work from Puerto Rico as a program manager, uh, specific with climate change, climate crisis and emergency preparedness and community mobilization in Puerto Rico and our, our related programs. So I've been working as an industrial hygienist for seven years now and, uh, and as a public health professional for four years mostly on emergency preparedness and management for the private se sector and now with um, emergency preparedness and management for vulnerable populations and rural areas in Puerto Rico. So um, you can pass for the next slide. Um, we want today to describe um, what a community mobilization model is and how can you integrate it on the emergency preparedness uh, process present the community mobilization program in Puerto Rico, that's why we're working as Microclinical Networks and its results, and describe how health centers um, address, how we can address um, social determinants of health using this model during uh, disasters. Next slide. 
So the community mobilization model um, integrates look what, what it is management and leadership, social communication and social mobilization. What it is is a way to engage communities and develop empowerment within the community to address an uh, issue. It can be health related or it can be community related, um, not exactly as health. Um, as part of this community mobilization model, you do a situation analysis. We identify stakeholders and do a resource mapping. We engage communication, especially um, types of communication that are targeted and especially for the community that we're working with. And we, have, we do a lot of planning um, to um, secure that this community mobilization or what issue we are addressing or targeting um, is sustainable. What, what, whatever practice we design or project or program should be planned and should be reviewed and should be sustainable so we can um, maintain it and keep at it. Next slide. Um, so why do we need community mobilization in emergency uh, management and preparedness? Basically, we have, and this is true also to another states rather than only for Puerto Rico, but we have recent experiences with natural disaster and emergencies when we have a lack of uh, or inappropriate government response. We have seen that community health centers have response to be um, leaders in the case of Puerto Rico during Maria. And we have seen community response in terms of their being organized and how they can um, get together with the community health centers to address emergency management. Um, in addition, the national emergency management frameworks um, addresses the limitations and challenges when a community is not organized and where those mobiliza mobilization doesn't occur, how we can, how that will weaken the national emergency response um, in some way and how it's more appropriate to have a bottom-up approach that is being organized as a community and then from the community to the government um, agencies in terms of um, emergency management. Um, in addition, why we can use this as community health centers is because it's part of our mission or uh, we have seen that vulnerable populations and under, underserved populations are hard, hardest hit um, by natural disasters. And we have seen that integrating this model can be benef can have direct and indirect benefits to the community health centers in various wave ways. Um, next slide. So how do we do it um, in terms of integrating the community mobilization model in the emergency management framework? Basically what we do is that we use all the steps that you see there, identification of challenges and opportunities based, uh, based on previous experiences, the identification of needs and resources and the capacity building in the three main phases, uh, phases of emergency management. That will be um, before, during and after um, an emergency and it, uh, or disaster. So what we wanna do is that we wanna do, know what our challenges, needs are during every phase of an emergency so we can target our preparedness and our programs to be able to function during all these phases and be addressed, uh, be targeted and be, um, be modeled by the needs and the profile of those communities working with us. Next slide. So where do the social determinant of health and community mobilization meet is that this model allows us to know the community, to identify the challenge and their impacts, and to adopt programs and strategies to be effective. And that is that once we start doing a community mobilization project, doesn't matter if it's for emergency preparedness or for other stuff, um, we get some information and we build a trust with that community that allow us to start identifying what challenges and maybe programs are not as affected because they have we have, we have been um, ignoring parts of the community that that need to be addressed in those programs um, and I'll give you an example with our, our program in community mobilization on that but basically is um, knowing their communities knowing their profile knowing that how they speak how they communicate um, what their leaders are um, how they work within their um, their own space and with um, government and other 
organizations and what their challenge and their impacts are so we can actually prepare um, for emergencies in a way that they can achieve that preparedness. So it doesn't matter that we have a really great plan right in, but if it doesn't um, address what the challenge they might present with the plan, it's not gonna it's not gonna function in terms of emergency preparedness. That's also true for every other program that we do um, in terms of health. Next slide. So during this program, we identify a specific role for the community health center during a community emergency preparedness. And that is that once we start doing this type of program with our communities, is that uh, the health center becomes a liaison between the government response agencies and the community. That's a really specific role. And that's because, um, be because of the kind of um, institution or organization that a community health center is, there already are some relationships with the, the government response agencies and relationships with the communities. It's, it's only um, clear that it should be the, the liaison, the community health center should be the liaison between those communities. In addition, um, the community health center may, um, may have a role supporting networks between non-government organizations and those communities um, in various ways. So you can be the place where they hold the meetings. They, you can be the, the one that speak a, a company, a, a, a community to an organization to ask for something. You can speak on behalf or with the community to address, to, to establish those networks. So it gives um, outsiders kind of a trust when you have an official organization. And after that network is created, then you can kind of support the network but not be kind of in the middle of that um, relationship. And after that, the sustainability of the plan of a community emergency preparedness plan, because when you integrate that community preparedness plan to the emergency management plan of the community health center, you address the part of that plan need to be reviewed. There has to be some kind of um, framework and programmatic um, establishment of that plan, of that community health uh, community plan with that community health center. So. Um, there's various roles for the community health center during uh, community emergency preparedness. Um, just be sure that you're not in charge of that plan. You're just here to facilitate and become a liaison. Um, of course, all the stuff that happened health-related health um, during emergency and that impact um, is going to be directly related to the services that the community health center can offer. Next slide. So um, direct and indirect impacts of the community mobilization during emergency preparedness is that a community health center with communities being prepared will have a, a less burden, burden during um, emergencies. So you have, we, if we take the situation with Puerto Rico, we had a lot of patients that were not prepared and then we have a lower overload of patients and that complicated the operational uh, process for the community health centers. So you, if you have communities that are now prepared, you only will um, get the patients that mo they need mo uh, most help in the first hours, and that gives you time to actually establish a, a, a more specific response rather than being the center where every community um, member goes to to get information or health services or medicine because they were not prepared. Um, you also get a clinical advantage of it because your your health outcomes after the disaster for people who are prepared are better than the, those who were not prepared. Um, in Puerto Rico, a lot of the deaths that came from Huracan Maria were attributed to chronic disease and people who did not get their treatment on time. So having um, communities prepared and having the knowledge of where those chronic disease patients are and how vulnerable they are to the disaster and how we can help them and gave them, giving them the knowledge on how to um, maintain their um, condition stable will help the community health center maintain a better clinical um, output. So you can have a benefit on your programs because once you get, as I said before, you get information regarding your community, you start getting information on other needs 
that maybe are not specific or strictly related to emergency preparedness, but is something that is related to one or two of your programs. So you can use the information that you get in the needs assessment in that new trust and building that communication and relationship through community mobilization into your other programs. And of course, there's a um, um, human resources part when you give this um, your staff the capacity building to deal with community mobilization and emergency preparedness that those tools will help them grow as a professional and personal um, areas to be to impact other areas of the community health center. Um, impacts that we have seen in the community members and community as a whole is that the communities are not more empo empowerment. So the more information and the more communication and the more heard they seem through the community mobilization model and programs, the more empowered are the communities to get together to uh, address an issue and to find uh, solutions for that issue. We have developed with them capacity building um, because we address um, needs for education in terms of how to do a, a, a family plan and in terms of emergency preparedness, how to um, get all the stuff together so they can respond to an emergency. And also because they are now more prepared, they will have um, a better health outcome when a situation like the Hurricane Maria um, comes again. Next slide. So um, the reason why we started doing the, the community mobilization project in Puerto Rico, and you see that you got, a, there's a figure giving a background and start, we don't start with Hurricane Maria as the first stop. We have an economic crisis that um, increase inequalities in some populations, in most of our populations. Um, we have uh, bigger lower income populations and or rural communities were starting to get less services because a lot of the government um, agencies which were given services regional uh, in the region were closed and now they will have to go to a central more distant office to get their services. Um, there were also both budget cuts in the health system that caused to be less services in terms of health. And then we have the natural disasters like Hurricane Maria, Hurricane uh, Irma. And after that followed what the Southwest, Southwest earthquakes and now COVID-19. So we started doing this when we saw uh, what happened with uh, Hurricane Maria and we observed the response and the leadership of the community health centers during the response of Hurricane Maria. So why was that response so efficient? Was the, the, their knowledge of the community needs, uh, previous relationship with community and the, the build the trust and the networks they already have uh, in the community and with the local government and with uh, federal government or even uh, organizations that were um, out of uh, Puerto Rico. Next slide. So here basically what we did um, and we are doing with our community health center partners, we um, get in a partnership with a community health center and they decide, designate a strategic team to be trained on emergency management tools like risk assessment, SWOT analysis, resource mapping, and mental health during emergencies, and risk communication, also community mobilization practice. So once we train them, they um, identified a community that were mo was the most affected to the Maria or during the recent disasters or emergency, and or has been um, identified as a community that they're having trouble um, integrating in their services, some, some type of, of challenges or, or concerns they have with a community in particular. And we um, invite that community to take part of this project. Uh, the community builds a, a strategic team there's themselves and start reflecting on challenges and vulnerabilities during or after Hurricane Maria. And now we add, of course, the new, the new situation that we have until now they map the resources and what they needs are and they have this meeting where they decide what how do they want to prepare and who whose role should should be played on what specific phase of the emergency preparedness so at the end we generate an action plan a preparedness frameworks 
we define the actors and plan for response and we plan for sustainability how are we going to keep this running who is in charge of what and and how are we going to guarantee that this is um this is working and continue to work next slide so uh, as a um, brief of on results we have uh, on the first year two community health centers that were part of our program um, and we impacted three communities, um, having the results of a community preparedness plan for each of the communities. So what we did is that after each community had that community preparedness plan, each of them integrated, uh, each center integrated that plan to their community emergency management plan in the center. Um, we kind of tested that, those response and those preparedness plans with the Southwest earthquakes because um, at least one of the community was also impacted for um, in the earthquakes. So we saw a quick impact and this um, report from the community to the community health center in terms of what happened in the community, who was impacted, what the needs are, wh how the shelter was working and that kind of information. And uh, information regarding health needs, um, if everybody had their uh, diabetes or repentation uh, under control and how they can um, be of health. There was an extensive response for organizations on the network. So they work on their resource mapping. And since the communication was so quick and so um, good, they were able to um, take the needs from the community um, that were not related to health and have a, a extensive communication with uh, outside organizations and government organizations to address the need for a secure shelter and food for the community. Um, and we also identified new challenges. We saw the, the shelter infrastructure wasn't that good and there was a problem on housing in terms of um, people who will need to shelter in other places because their houses were not um, as, as stronger as they thought. And we also build a stronger relationship and trust with the from the community to the community health center because as they saw the response, they trusted more the work that they will they were doing for the last year during the past year, and they saw that this actually worked. Um, having a preparedness plan and having a connection to that community health center worked for them in terms of being able to respond to that emergency. During this year, we're working with six um, communities, new communities, and um, we have seen that some of them are kind of a pause, but we have a current work with farm worker population in one community health center because of the needs that we've seen during the COVID-19 um, epidemic and the farm worker population in Puerto Rico. So we continue to work with them to get their needs assessment and to be sure to now address more types of emergency during com um, with communities like COVID-19. Next slide. So key lessons, um, the community mobilization and emergency preparedness are continuous processes. That means that when we start a community mobilization and we build that relationship with the community, we got to be sure that we are there for them in the long run, that we are going to be um, preparing and reviewing those community health plans and be able to provide that community with the knowledge and education of new um, resources and findings towards preparing for emergency and disasters. Um, community networks can improve preparedness and health outcomes during emergencies. Uh, a prepared community um, in a prepared community health center with that information will um, will make way for better health outcomes during times like um, hurricane and, and wildfires and other kind of emergencies. Community health centers are key institutions to strengthen community and other organizations relationship. We didn't see this at first as, as something that we expected to happen, but seeing a community grow up and, and get empowered by a community mobilization process to, have, to work on emergency preparedness is how that community is now organized and working on other issues. Um, and how they trust the community health center as a key institution to, um, so they can rely on them is something that you can see as a as a benefit of this process. And the other part that we want to be sure, and I know that was a question that was asked before, the role of the community health worker is that this is the key staff that it will build the connection with the community 
with the um, to the community health center. So in our community health preparedness and community preparedness plans and the community health center manage emergency management plan, we designated the community health worker as the lead in that intersection uh, where the community health worker, we, we build the capacity and we train the community health worker to be able to then train the community um, on how to prepare for emergencies and at the same time identify those, need, those needs and the community profile and get back to the community health center to build up the uh, a, a preparedness and response that can address that community profile. That means that when the community health workers work a community mobilization process can go back to the community health center and give information so or programs don't fall when a community when an emergency arises so that's basically the 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 role of the community health worker um, within both plans the community preparedness plan and the community health center uh, emergency preparedness plan i think that was my last like yeah thank you so much mary so that's super interesting and i just really um am struck by how important that that work is um and yeah i, I think it, it involves so much of the the listening that i think is critical to really advancing uh racial socioeconomic just improving um inequalities um and addressing that in our in our society and particularly in preparedness plans um we are just a reminder to everyone that there is a brief webinar evaluation um at the conclusion of this and we do apologize that we've we've gone over pretty significantly into some of the discussion time but let's go ahead and move into one of the our first question our first discussion question um which are, you know, what are strategies that your health center or your site has used to address social determinants of health during this pandemic? And we have to have you um, put it into the into the chat box. And so while we're waiting for some chat, um, some chatter in the box, um, if any of our panelists have uh, know of stories that you've heard from health centers, what what health centers specifically have done to address it, social determinants of health? Sure, I can speak to that. Uh, this is Tina from Massachusetts. Some of our centers, as they were um, getting their testing capacity rolled up, they partnered with food and security agencies and were able to connect people as they were coming in for testing with food resources, especially for those who were having trouble engaging um, SNAP benefits in Massachusetts, uh, which is, you know, our, that's what we call it. I don't know what other states call it, if it's called SNAP everywhere now, <laughs> that's not my field, but um, that was something that was really seen as, as a huge need, especially for school-aged children who only get their nourishing meals at school to make sure that um, food deserts were also being um, addressed as we were rolling out testing availability. It looks, like some, it looks like we're getting some chat here um, from Danielle. Uh, it looks like some, some of the health centers are doing this off-site COVID-19 testing um, and helping support local resources. So that's great to hear um, as well. And I know up in the chat when Tina was presenting, we had folks um, sharing that patients sometimes don't know, you know what, what telehealth is or what, what they're supposed to be doing, what their responsibility is of patients in those encounters. And I think that might be a really important piece, um, Tina, about your sort of PSA campaign, is even educating patients about these new tools and how are they supposed to engage with those. And, um, you know, maybe, I don't know if um, all three of you can, can speak to that, but that would be something I think that would be incredibly helpful, knowing that telehealth is definitely here to stay um, in terms of a, a, a tool for, for primary care visits. Yes, that was something we recognized really, really upfront was that there, there is a misunderstanding or a lack of knowledge uh, of what a telehealth visit could look like. And even we've been learning as we're going, we're building the plane as we're flying it. 
and we've adjusted our methods and our health centers have weekly calls to discuss what's working and what's not. And the next step that we're looking at is also educating patients on remote monitoring equipment and how to safely and efficiently be able to use that with your providers back at the health center. And translation is also another big part of that. Um, we wanna make sure that during a telehealth visit, there's access to language um, capacity as well. Great, thanks. And this, uh, here's another sort of question. I know we're, you know, kind of um, mixing our discussion time and question time, which is, I think, um, a great, you know, great to see both. Maybe for Mary Sell, you know, this question is, you know, do you have any examples of structural changes that target change in racial disparity? So, you know, Jillian, to your point, in sort of trying to improve access or, you know, decrease inequities, what are some of those structural pieces that might be important to think about? Well, I think um, part of this is including actually have that particip participation from the for the from the communities in that planning. Uh, a lot of the um, in terms of emergency preparedness and, and social determinant of, of health, what we've seen that there's a kind of a one size fit, fits all kind of preparedness plan from the government agencies. Um, including the Department of Health and that kind of stuff. And when you don't have the communities taking part of that planning and preparedness and actually hearing what their needs are, um, it's difficult to actually have an efficient response. And I think that's the most the, the main issue is to, that you have to start doing the bottom up approach when you are doing the planning in every part of your organization, that being the health department, the municipality or, or, or local leadership and, and the community health centers. Um, to have the the information and the participation of the community health uh, community leaders uh, to be able to actually hear what they need um, and what actually their um, resources are to be able to prepare and to be part of that response. I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, yeah, I, I think it absolutely did. I think you know if health centers have patient um, advisors or if they have patients as board members in their health center, um, they should be really involved in, um, in contributing to those emergency preparedness plans um, and, and trying to you know, work with the health center to identify resources um, that may be helpful. And you, you can even um, um, start with little stuff like starting the discussion with your patients in terms of um, asking in your visit, um, are you prepared for the next like, upcoming hurricane season? Do you have um, enough water? Do you know what, how to prepare? Do you have any challenges? That kind of questions as a patient, even though it's not community mobilization, but starting that discussion with your patients um, because it does affect their health. So you have to recognize that. And, and one thing on the telehead, uh, telemed stuff for Puerto Rico, it may be that we, use it as a day-to-day -day kind of process and we start integrating that um, that system but when we talk about storms or other kind of disaster the, the reality is that communication systems fail so it's not something that we can rely for emergency response so we need to still have other kind of communication system and other, for, other forms of get to know where patients are and how our patients are and that that is kind of what we want to do is to have that trust and build um, bridges with the communities to be able to get the information quickly and to be able to serve um, that population. You know it's interesting too Marcel um, as you're talking about that because there's a couple of comments that have come in that resonate. Um, one person talked about when trying to address social determinants of health that they've used their existing relationships with patients to ask specifically who has needs and to try and help those to help meet those needs, such as food and medicine. And I think that's really um, indicative of, you know, they had taken, they had built, they were working with relationships that have been built over time, which is part of that community mobilization component. Um, and then 
uh, from Denver, um, the model that they use and is dealing with community health workers and promotoras de salud. Um, and during the pandemic, it's, he says that they, re, they uh, focused on reaching out directly to people to help them navigate resources. Um, and there's a term here that being able to serve as the connective tissue between community, which I think is a lovely um, visual kind of metaphor for the role that community health centers can play is being that connective tissue, that sort of network that helps link up resources in the yeah, that's a, that's a good point. That's why I, I just fast forwarded. I know we only have a few minutes, but fast forwarded to this question, Jillian, because I think that is a really good point. You know, health centers are by by definition part of the community network. You know, and and we sometimes talk about medical neighborhoods and things like that. You know, we I wonder how that sense has sort of changed over time um, during this time specifically. And you know, to Marisol's point, um, it seems like that you know health centers even before disasters it's really critical to really insert your insert themselves into that network as that connective tissue i really like that phrase too that someone shared um, great and then someone just shared some some lar some lessons learned um, from STOH, communications, knowing what to say, partnerships, absolutely, and access to services is super important. Um, I think all of these things are, are great sort of um, reflection points that can be incorporated into plans for the future, for sure. But feel free to um, chat in the chat box about things that you've noticed about, you know, changes to your network, uh, you know, how you've seen your community grow during this time. Um, I know that we are at 3.30 Eastern time. So I'm with um, as you all continue to chat into the chat box, we'll leave it open um, obviously for a couple more minutes since we were um, we had so much content today, which is never a, uh, a bad thing. But I will just fast forward to make sure that you all know about our email addresses and have the contact information for all of our panelists today. Um, and just to know um, you know that you can contact any of the uh, presenters with questions or if you want more information more um, ideas about how you can address the pandemic and of course other issues that we've all seen you know come up across the country over the last couple of days you know thinking about um, reaching out to those, those faculty and speakers for support if needed and Danielle you'll remind us uh, that the evaluation will be sent right after the webinar Correct, right after the webinar and uh, in the follow-up email. Wonderful. Okay, well, I think um, that we could talk a lot longer on these things. I always feel like I want more time, but we are at time. So I want to thank everybody for, for attending and particularly for our faculty for being a part of this, being with us today. And please, you know, I really do want to emphasize um, reaching out to any of us with questions or if you want to continue the conversation. I think this is the conversation that we're going to be having for many, many months, if not years to come. So I, I think it's um, it would be wonderful to hear from, from any of you who want to just continue um, brainstorming or sharing some of your promising practices and ideas. But yeah, I echo Jillian, thank you for um, attending and for our presenters, especially for being here today. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Jillian. Thank you. Thank you, team. Great, thank you, everyone. Have a good day.